Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the introduction to the Labyrinth uh, session. The session is in recording. Um, I also want to explain to you that this is how it will be. On Thursday or Friday, I will be posting theory videos for you to watch. Um, you can watch it while doing something. You can do it uh, fast forward if you want. You don't have to take notes or draw. This is about uh, getting to know with Labyrinth, the knowledge, the information behind the practice session that will be happening on Mondays, okay? So that's how it's gonna be. Six sessions we will have in information as I will be giving the theory, the explanation to what will happen, the six sessions that will be practical, okay? So without further ado, welcome to the course. I'm very excited uh, to present this amazing Neuro Labyrinth course to you um, as we will be exploring amazing ways to bring transformation, spiritual growth, and the way to bring any project you have ahead into reality, okay? Let's start exploring. I want to bring you the background behind the, the, the labyrinth, okay? What is the labyrinth about? Why, you know, what, what is the story? Um, I'm gonna share my presentation with you. Let's talk about mythology and symbolism, which will bring us further to the most important part, okay? Um, anybody can take and reach the Greek uh, legends and myth, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go further with you guys, okay? I'm gonna explain to you what each character in the story of the labyrinth represents, how they are relevant, what are their significance, and most importantly, exactly why we're here. What do we do with it? How do we use it within our everyday life, okay? This in a way is a kind of a preview to the archetypes course that I am in the middle of development. Um, maybe toward the uh, second part of this year, I will be able to bring it to you, okay? Let's do this. This is very exciting. This is a lot of fun. Prepare to go, you know, prepare to open up a little child within you as you listen to the myth and the legends and then bring out that that's connecting to your inner child, but then you will connect to your inner adult as we will learn about the symbol of, of what labyrinths and the characters of the labyrinth story represents, okay? Pay attention to the cover picture that I, I posted here, okay? You see the, the circular uh connections the circular geometrical lines are the visual depiction of the labyrinth okay there are people here by the front okay what you will see you see here what will make more sense toward the end of this session toward the end of this presentation okay pay attention to the knights and pay attention to the creature Okay, what happened to the creature? The head is off, right? The creature is unusual. Many of you know who that is. Okay, if you don't, I'm not going to open up. But if you do, you do. That means um, you were like me and you were an avid reader and you probably read up on the Greek um, mythology. Okay. Okay, let's go. What is a labyrinth? Okay, take a piece of paper or... Just think about it. I'm gonna give you a few seconds. What associations come to your mind at the very beginning when you hear the word labyrinth? Okay, write it down or just keep it in your mind and let's see what matches reality, okay? It is interesting to see when I entered the word labyrinth in the Google search engine, images of labyrinths and movie websites with the name of labyrinths come up, okay? In the summer of 2023, I actually did the labyrinth, the neuro labyrinth course in Russian. I did it live in New York. Um, and when I was searching the Google, and when I wrote down labyrinth in Russian, it gave me movies. Uh, most of the, almost all of those movies were psychological thrillers, okay? 
Now, if you type it up in English, there are two major movies. There are different things come up. But if we talk about movies, which is visual entertainment for the for the uh, people, right? Um, two major movies came up. One was called The Labyrinth, and it was like a, a children's like similar, like a, like a fairy tale, I would say. Uh, I think it was also geared toward adults too, not more like children, more for adults, like one of those fairy tales for adults. Uh, David Bowie was playing as a main role. Um, and of course, there is a Pan's Labyrinth, and there are a few movies that are labyrinth that are also psychological thrillers, okay? So it's interesting to start understanding why do people, why do screenwriters and directors uh, make movies with the name Labyrinth, and how is it connected to the psychological thriller? Let's try to figure this out, okay? Let's go to the source. What I'm presenting to you, that's why I did it as a first session. This is the source, of what is the labyrinth, okay? Now, if any of you have written down the labyrinths are associated with Greek mythologies, you were right, okay? Let's look at the labyrinths and explore. And for some of you maybe remember the Greek mythology in which we're introduced to the labyrinths itself, okay? Let's start from the very, very beginning. Even before we go to the Greek mythology, let's start understanding why. Why we are connecting to the Greek mythology? What is the purpose of that, okay? In order to understand what is the purpose of that, I am bringing to you the name of this presentation, the mythology and symbolism, okay? The symbolism of labyrinths, which is why I ask in the beginning, write down what are your association? What was the purpose for that? to figure out what is happening within our consciousness, right? Those of you, most of you who are watching this are probably familiar with the neurographic method. Do you remember what is the first step we do? We do the brainstorming. We start figuring out what is happening within us. Why, what we think, we take down for two minutes, we write down whatever thoughts come to our mind when we think about a certain goal or a certain topic, okay? And that's the idea, the symbolism within our conscious is connected to the Jungian world called archetype, okay? The world archetype was coined by Carl Gustav Jung. You see his pictures in the presentation now. He's a Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, okay? He was a disciple of uh, Sigmund Freud, the very first um, psychoanalyst, uh, the founder of the psychotherapy. And uh, Carl Gustav Jung went a bit further, okay? He went in a different direction. That's why he kind of, they broke ways with Freud. Jung founded the analytical psychology. Now, again, those of you who are relevant to the neurographic method, neurographic method is based upon the analytical psychology founded by Jung, okay? Jung was a prolific author, illustrator, and correspondent. He was a complex and controversial character. Jung was the one, he traveled to the West, I'm sorry, to the East, um, He's the one who brought the ideas of Eastern philosophy into the Western world. He decided to connect it. He brought the ideas into the psychology world, okay? The, uh, the, 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 those of you who enjoy drawing mandalas, right? The idea came from Freud. Or Freud is the one who started bringing the explanation to why the mandala is such a great way to connect to uh, relaxation, you know, harmony, um, care, comfort, okay? He talked a lot about the archetype, okay? Okay, so let's read about it. Archetypes are universal inborn mo model models of people, behavior, and personalities that play a role in influencing a human behavior. Carl Jung's theory suggests that these archetypes were archaic forms of innate human knowledge passed down from our ancestors, okay? In Jungian psychology, these archetypes represent universal patterns and images that are part of the collective unconscious. Jung believes that we inherit these archetypes much in the way we inherit instinctive patterns of behavior, okay? Jung believed that the human psyche was composed of three components, the ego, the personal unconscious, and the collective unconscious. To go back to what archetypes represent, again, um, 
if you ever watched the way uh, I have an open session where I explain the shapes, the alphabet of Neurographica, and when we discuss what the shapes represent, the circle, the triangle, the square, we refer to the Jungian idea of the archetypes, right? Um, I remember in the beginning when I would, even still now, when I explain to people what circle represent, they, they get very confused, they get very surprised, and they and I can see like this this like surprise in their eyes. Like, is that true? Are you like making it up on the spot? And um, it takes time for me, but when I explain and actually give them examples and explanation, connect them to the actual way it actually makes sense. Um, give them some scientific explanation, psychological explanation to what the circle represents. You know how it's connected to care, comfort. Uh, feminine energy, motherly love, you know, inner child and all that stuff. Um, it takes some time, but then people do connect to it because it is an inner, innate human knowledge passed down from our ancestors, okay? It represents, again, like it says here, represents universal patterns and images that are part of a collective unconscious. This is very important to remember, okay? So going back, Jung believes that there are three major parts to the way our mind works, okay? The ego, the personal unconscious, and the collective unconscious, okay? We discussed this as we do the pyramid of consciousness. If you ever watched the video, I hope you did. Um, if you didn't, go watch it. Even if you don't have anything to do with Neurographica, watch it. It's extremely interesting, informative, knowledgeable. You will get a lot of enjoyment out of it, okay? So according to Jung, the ego represents the conscious mind. And the personal, personal unconscious contains memories, including those that have been suppressed, okay? The collective unconscious is a unique component where Jung believed that this part of the psyche served as a form of psychological inheritance, okay? It contains all of the knowledge and experiences that we humans share as a species, okay? Which is why I'm going to say what I said um, earlier to some of my students. Um, it's important to remember that what we're going to discuss, A, we connect mostly and will make sense mostly to those of you who, A, either read the Greek mythology and may connect to, to the memory of remembering the story, maybe not, but it will make kind of sense to you. B, if you grew up in the Western world, if you did not grow up in the Western world, if you grew up in the East, if you grew up in the um, Muslim uh, based, uh, Islam-based countries, okay, where the predominant way of thinking is not the Western world. Now, the Western philosophy, the philosophy of the Western world is actually based upon the Greek mythology. That's why a lot of concepts that we bring here, that's why, that's why what Jung did makes sense to people who live in the Western world. If you came from the Eastern world, if you came from the world where the philosophy of the Islam religion, um, also maybe Judaic religion, was predominant, it will make less sense. It will still connect to you because we're still connecting to the major, general, human, doesn't matter what religion, which background, which culture. It will connect you to the basic understanding of what the world represents, the symbols of the world, like what I bring again as a circle, and we connect to the sun as a circle, we connect to the planet as a circle, right? The universe is a, is a circular idea, right? All the planets are a circular idea. And same thing with the Greek mythology, okay? If it doesn't connect with you as much, it's okay. You can actually even let me know. As when I'm developing the archetypes course, I'm actually going to bring not just the Greek mythology, which is, again, the basis for the Western world, the Christian world, okay? Christianity is came from the Roman, Greek or Roman um, understanding of the world. And that includes the Greek mythology. If you are, again, of the Judeo-Islamic background, it will make less sense to you, okay? Like I said, my archetype course will include... Um, archetypes from different uh, cultures, okay? Uh, Buddhism is the same way, by the way, if you're of like Eastern background and not as much 
if you didn't grow up, even if you learned the Western uh, philosophy, let's say in college, but if you didn't grow up as a child in the Western way of thinking, which is highly connected and based upon the Greek mythology, it may make less sense to you, but it will make sense to you later on, okay? Just wanna bring that disclaimer, but um, let's go on, okay? This is what Carl of Jung's map of the psyche looks like, okay? This makes sense. This is very important to understand because it will connect to what the labyrinths represent, okay? Uh, labyrinths as, even though it's an ancient construction, an ancient concept, the way it's being utilized, because remember, we're here for the labyrinths, not just to learn how to walk the labyrinths or the knowledge, but also how to use it for practical purposes within therapeutic and coaching way, okay? Very important part. So the way Carl Jung represented the psyche, right, the mind, is this way, okay? This is the self, this is the consciousness, okay? Ego is actually the consciousness. Persona is the mask. Those of you in the who are familiar with the Dilts pyramid, persona is the identity, the mask, the roles that we wear, okay? Outer world is our surrounding, people around us, okay, who are expecting us to do, to act a certain way. So as a result, we take upon ourselves a certain persona, we wear a certain mask, we play different roles uh, because and we put on our ego, we work with our ego, um, which is kind of the job of the ego is to protect our inner self from the outer world, from the harm, okay? The basic instinctual idea of the ego, the basic instinctual job of the ego, protect me from harm, okay? Those of you who remember who did the values course with, us, with me, remember the value protection from harm, okay? Then we have the self. Okay, the self is my true self. Okay, it, it's amazing how um, in English it actually makes sense. Like when when I explaining this in Russian, it was a bit harder because it's amazing how in English the word self is connected to myself. Okay, the word myself is actually includes the word self, which is your true identity, not what you show to the world but the true identity that is connected to your soul, to your soul mission, okay? So the self hides a shadow, our deepest, deepest, darkest fears that our ego pushes through, okay? Our ego tries to hide the fear because it's job to show to the world the persona that doesn't get feared, that's fearless. But the fear doesn't go anywhere. It goes through the self and it hides in the shadow, and then we have something we call anima and animus, okay? Important part, again, in the labyrinths as it relates to the feminine and masculine parts of who we are. Notice, not female and male. Used to be called female, male. Nowadays, we don't do that, okay? Um, nowadays, with different ways people relate to gender, okay? We're going to bring an open way of relating to it, okay? Okay. Um, so anima and animus, okay? The connection to the fem feminine and masculine energy within us. And of course, there is an inner world which connects us to the soul, okay? Um, one of the most interesting and provocative archetypes we encounter in, junior, in Jungian psychology is that of the anima and animus, okay? Here you go. Connected to the yin and yang. Yang and yin and yun uh, uh, symbol. Notice here, okay? The anima and animal relates to our inner or soul life, okay? And that's what I said. It's not about us being male or female. It's rather that each one of us, in spite of who, what our gender is, but we have connection to both the feminine energy within us and the masculine energy. We connect to ancestors, both male and female. We connect both to our great-grandparents and great-great-grandfather and great-grandmother, okay? Um, we have the right to resources from them in both genders, okay? No, not soul as understood in the metaphysical form as something which lives on beyond our physical existence, but rather soul as the inner force that animates us, okay? That's the word animal. The soul definition stems from a time when Jung was doing this work where the gender roles were more traditionally and clearly differentiated, okay? Remember, Jung did this in the 50s, 50s, 60s, okay? So some of what follows in the definition of anima and animus may not apply today, okay? May, 
because like I said, it has been shifted due to different transgendering, different identities. Notice, okay, we're going back to identities, personas that people wear to connect to their ego so nobody would give them harm, which connects, to, which hides their true self, okay? Our goal in life for all, every single one of us is to true, to reach our true self, which we can't do because we're so preoccupied with ego, okay? Um, so, but we do we need to remember a lot of things, what we're going to say today, if we talk metaphorically, symbolically, will make a lot of sense to us, okay? Let's talk about it, okay? Just to give you, we're going to talk more about this, maybe in the third or the fourth session, okay? But for now, I'm just going to quickly give it to you, okay? Not going to read everything. Aspects of anima, and you tell me what that means to you, okay? The anima is right hemisphere way of processing based on focus on information focus on figurative nonverbal thinking intuition irrationality rationality ambivalence and 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 okay ability to do several things at once okay priority of feelings and experiences compassion warmth tenderness chaotic impulsive what energy comes to your mind? Is it feminine or masculine? I don't hear you, but I think I do hear your answer. Most of you will answer the right way, okay? Fear of actions, more focus on inner strength, the morality, uh, passivity, softness, compromise, flexibility, adaptability is are the important characteristic traits. Preservation, preservation of the old, the word preservation is a key word here. Process orientation. Focus on the past, shaping, okay? Collectivity, self-sacrifice, support, and consent. When I say shaping, it's about the shape, ahem, ahem, body. Um, who focuses on their body more, males or females? There's another hint, right? Um, again, self-sacrifice. Who are more self-sacrifice? Who, who, who bring more self-sacrifice, males or females? Support consent, okay? Of course, this is connected to the female, the way, again, general conceptions of the way females are perceived in the world, okay? Doesn't mean that all of them are like that. I know a lot of females who are who will do more of the blue side of the aspects, the aspects of animus, okay? So the left hemisphere, animus represent the left hemisphere way of processing, talking more about formal logic, symbolic, verbal thinking, logical thinking, rationality is very, very important. Focus on rationality. Focus on alternativity. It's either or, okay? More like, you know, um, principle-based, right? You either do this or this, my way or the highway, right? With females, it's like, how about I give you a choice? Do you want to eat uh, uh, potatoes or do you want to, should I make rice for you or potatoes? Should I make both for you? You know, nurturing, comfort, care, feminine approach to life, right? This is masculine, okay? There's like the masculine approach is like, uh, you either eat rice or, or potatoes. Why take both? Like, it's a different approach, okay? It's a different like way. There's not much like, you know, it's not about nurturing. It's about just get yourself full, okay? Focus on one thing at a time as opposed to female, they are able to do multitasking, right? The priority of desires and actions, goal orientation, okay? It's about how do I reach my goal, okay? It's not about feelings and experience, no. Okay, it's about emotional restraint. Don't care much about, you know, let's talk about emotions. Let's talk about what's happening to us. Let's express emotion now. We are fine. We're doing okay. We got married. We're doing fine. You know, we don't need to talk about emotions. Okay. Again, maybe cliche, maybe general. I personally know a lot of men who are very sensitive, who talk more about emotions than their wives or their spouses. Okay. Again, that's why I say it's not about female or male. It's about feminine and masculine energy. Pay attention. Okay. Fear of feelings similar to what I said, they're into order and sequence, okay? They're into external strength, 
Okay, not about the shaping as in the body, uh, do I look fat, but rather do I look strong? Do I am I strong? Do I look strong? Okay. Remember the way the way the males and females work out differently. Okay. Female workout, how do I lose weight? Male workout is how do I gain muscle? Okay. How do I look masculine? Right? Connection to the instinctive masculine energy. If I look masculine enough, I look strong enough to protect my tribe, to protect my family, to protect my spouse, okay? Fear of feeling, activity, firmness, cruelty, straightforwardness, uncompromising, okay? As opposed to the female feminine energy, which is more softness, pliability, flexibility, compromise, okay? Expansion of territory conquered, okay? about uh it's about land i i need to own land okay but a uh, female is more about preservation okay are we honoring our ancestors are we honoring those who lived here before okay results oriented i am focused on the goal i need to reach the goal while female is process oriented how do i enjoy the journey future oriented focus on the past okay Females are the ones who talk more about, oh, I can't believe they did this to me. And, uh, you know, they tend to focus and live more in the past, kind of reliving the past, okay? Man is like, okay, let's move on. How do I get beyond it? Making sense, um, individualism, right? Females are, feminine energy is more about collectivity, okay? Collectiveness, grouping together. How do I connect, right? Chatting with women, any of you saw that that uh, joking uh, thing I put down, right? The two women meet and it's like a few hours has passed, they're still like chatting, right? And that's the idea. Selflessness, protection, competition. Ooh, we know that word. That should go number one here, right? Not the last one. Female, feminine approach, self-sacrifice, support, consent. Now, why is this relevant to the Greek mythology? This will make sense as we explore the background of what the labyrinth story represents, okay? Zeus and Europa. Okay, let's go to the myth. Now we're ready to get into the myth, okay? Now, after we discuss the feminine and the masculine energy, what I want to tell you is why. What is it connected to? Where does it come from? How is it based? What is it shaped by? Why do we connect to why do we view self-sacrifice, support, and consent as feminine qualities while protection, competitiveness, and selflessness and like goal orientation as a masculine approach to any project? Why is this important? It's very important to know what represents what because in this course, we will be exploring both the left side entry, which will focus on the feminine aspect, intuition based, developing your intuitiveness. And we're going to explore the right side entry of the labyrinth, which will explore the goal orientation, dealing, reaching the goal. Okay, guys? Very important to do both. Okay, let's get back to the original, okay? Very, very origins of what the labyrinth story represents, okay? Because the labyrinth is connected to the story of Minos and the Minotaur and Thesis, okay? Now, let's go back around to start again, to, to start connecting and understanding the symbolism. The myth, the, the Greek mythology, Zeus is the major god. He's the god, the major, the, the head of the god. You know, I can talk, call, call my daughter here, who she's an uh, uh, a, a 11 and a half year old uh, 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 specialist on all the Greek mythology. She knows it by heart. You wake her up, she will tell you who is who. I actually asked her when I was preparing this, I was like consulting her. I was like, wait, remind me again, who is this and who is that? It's uh, the favorite topic of our talks, okay? So, so the legend Zeus, which is this major God, okay? Uh, Zeus, just for you guys to understand, is the symbol of masculine energy, okay? Zeus is known for his uh, uh, romantical, AKA, I hope only adults listening, sexual escapades, okay? He's known in the Greek mythology for constantly falling in love with somebody, either another goddess or mostly human females, and 
abducting them and then you know getting to know them talking about the biblical way of of uh sexual context right um and then kind of forgetting about them at a certain moment having a child with that woman and then moving on okay very what what does that remind you of male approach to things okay um zeus is a lot of times is depicted in the mythology in the mythology I'm sorry, mythology, not methodology. In the Greek myth, myth, he often turns into a bull, okay? In this specific story, he did this, okay? Group, Zeus saw Europe. Europe was a beautiful princess. She was playing with her friend on the seashore. He fell in love with her. As a child, that really struck me. That was so surprising to me. I remember thinking, oh my God, what is this? Okay, but this is what happens with Zeus. I used to... I had a book of Greek mythology that I read a lot about it, okay? He would fall in love, and whenever he would fall in love with a woman, he, his goal was to get her no matter what, whether she was married in real life or not, whether she had a husband, a human husband. Had, he was the Greek, he's a main Greek god, and according to that, he's entitled to anything and anyone, okay? And he often used that, usurpated that right to get any woman he wanted, okay? So what he did, he decided to kidnap Europe, okay? Uh, I don't remember at that point she was already engaged um, to marry somebody. So he decided to kidnap. What does he do? He formed, he turns into a white bull. Pay attention, it's a white bull. Okay, it's a bull, but he's white. The color representation is very important. Remember the representation of color white? Pure, okay? Uninhibited. Spirituality, something positive the white color is positiveness okay and he kidnaps her he takes he he puts her on her back you see that in the symbolic uh, statue that they have it they i believe this is um somewhere in actually in greece okay in crete maybe i don't remember which island okay he puts her on his back he swims through the ocean can you believe it bull swimming what is it talking about? Something unusual, okay? Even that, he shows that he's not just a, a, any bull. He's a god that turned into bull, okay? Um, and they swim to the island of Crete. Again, pay attention to the place, Crete, location. On the island of Crete, Zeus took the form of a beautiful youth, okay? Now, he's not even, <laughs> he's not even turning back to himself, right? He's doing this... Um, uh, Greek mythology way of, uh, uh, what do you call it, aesthetic uh, plastic surgery, right? And he wants to look good for this woman, right? And he takes possession of Europe, right? He has sex with her and from this union. And that happens not just once. For a certain time, he kept her on the island and he would visit her. And she had three children with him. The first son name is Minus, then he had Rhodomantus and Serpedon. Serpedon, okay? I may not pronounce it maybe with the right um, uh, pronunciation, but it doesn't matter because this is these are Greek names. So even the way we say it, in, Americans may say it may not be appropriate, okay? Um, because Greeks pronounce it in a completely different way. But anyway, we pay attention to the first son, the Minus, okay? After a certain time, Okay, he lets go of Europe. That's again something. Uh, uh, if you ever read, uh, if you remember what I was telling you about Zeus, he falls in love. He's very impulsive. He takes a woman. He owns her. Then after a certain time, he falls out of love. He lets her go, and she goes and she usually marries another human, right? Um. So Europa married Asterion. Asterion is the king of Crete. Okay, she stays in that island. She marries the king of Crete. He cannot have children naturally, okay? And he actually adopts her three children, minus Rodomantus and Serpedon. And as a result, because he adopts them, they have full power to their inheritance, okay? He allows them to inherit the kingdom of Crete, okay? And of course, the way it usually works, it goes to the first son, who is... Minus, okay? Now, minus, it's important to note, was very much connected to 
his father, the real father, Zeus, he, uh, we all have this, we all in our life connect either strongly, stronger, one of the parents were connected more stronger than the other. Um, if you start paying attention, you will notice that's a psychological way. That's a soul mission. We come to this world to either help one parent or the other more than the other. Okay. Um, for example, me, it's connected to my father. A lot of people connect more to their mother. It depends. Okay. My husband, for example, connected more to his mother. So that's what it is. Okay. Now, Minus was very much connected to the fact that he is the son of God. Okay. Just so you know, um, now it's interesting pay attention to this statue europe on a bull is depicted on the upburst of a two euro coin issued by the bank of greece okay when the country joined eurozone and it's still in circulation today so it's important to start understanding this is not just silly mythology silly stories and legends it's quite concurrent you know people pay attention countries like greece put it on their coins on their currency People pay attention. This is very relevant to the way we think, okay? The way I just explained to you, even the symbolism of who Zeus is, okay? It's important to understand that's how Minus related to life as this major idea of masculine way of reaching any goal in life, okay? Uh, I actually collected here beautiful paintings for you to to look at, okay, the abduction of Europa by Rembrandt, okay, absolutely beautiful, enjoy. The abduction of Europa by Tipolo, okay, famous uh, Italian painter, Renaissance painter, okay. Okay, you can notice here. Um, okay, over here you notice the white bull, and uh, that's Zeus who turns to white bull. He abducts Europa from her friends, okay? They're playing by the seashore. And over here, pay attention to what's happening also, okay? The friends are playing, but there's a commotion. The bull is invading to, to steal Europa, okay? To abduct her, okay? Another uh, beautiful, uh, what, again, what I'm trying to show you is that look how, look how important, look how much, Famous, famous painters relate to this topic, okay? In the Western world, this was a very important topic that was discussed, connected to philosophy, um, that you can see art represents what was concurrent, what's uh, important to people, what's on people's mind, basically, okay? It's interesting to know that over here, the bull is represented in the black color, okay? Goya which is known for his, Francisco Goya is a Spanish painter. He's known for his um, more um, morbid type of like approach in art, okay? That's a France and um, Europa is being adopted, but notice he depicted the bull not as white, but rather as black, showing his attitude, okay? I'm an art history minor, just FYI. So I will give you a lot of symbolism that, that artists represent in their painting, okay? So what Goya did, he took the opposite. In the myth, it's a white bull, but Goya showed him as black, why? He's trying to show that this was a wrong thing to do. Notice Goya lived many centuries before, but already back then, we know art represented what? A more liberal, a more uh, upscale, a more fast forward way of viewing the world, viewing, okay? It wasn't right what Zeus did by turning into an animal and abducting a woman, okay? So that's something to keep in mind, okay? That even back then, a few centuries ago, artists would depict this idea that it's not okay to abduct and usurpate a woman of her rights, okay? This is a, a Russian, uh, even I would say Soviet uh, painter, Valentin Sirov, also called the abduction of Europa. The bull here, we can see neither white nor black, it's red. Maybe relevant to the fact that it's a Soviet uh, painter, okay, Soviet artist. And uh, even notice, by the way, the way Europe is dressed, okay? This is more relevant, again, to the way uh, the time people would dress in the Renaissance era, right? Uh, also Renaissance era, right? Also Renaissance era, okay? We know Greeks didn't dress like that. 
Okay, so ancient Greek definitely didn't dress like that. So definitely relevant to the era. You can see this was done in the last century, right? Look at the way, though, how modern this woman is dressed. Notice, okay, look at her dress, okay? Beautiful, very interesting, right? Uh, uh, you can do... Um, you can do you can write dissertations on this topic on the on deciphering each painting, which we're not going to do because we're focusing on the mythology and symbolism. Okay. Now, what does me, Minus do? Okay, Minus, uh, the king, the son of Zeus, uh, who inherited from Asterion, the island of Crete. Okay, remember what I said? Europe married the Cretan uh, king Asteris, Asterion, who adopted all her sons. Okay. Now, after the death of Asterius, Minos begins to lay claim to kingship, okay? Assuring that he was destined by, this, by the gods, okay? That's how people lived in the Greek mythology time. Um, they would do everything by the gods. The gods had to favor them. And that all his prayers would be fulfilled, okay? What do you think he does, guys? What does, what would be... Uh, I'll explain it to you this way, okay? He managed to come to power. Now, let's talk about symbolism and it will answer my question. Minus is an alpha male symbol, a macho. This this macho symbolism um, of how a male is supposed to represent is super strong. All the cliches, generalized things that I read before when we talked about animus, right? The masculine energy representation, Okay. Uh, remember, Minus is the ruler of the Cretan civilization. Cretan civilization is a world where men rule, okay? There is no uh, feminine energy is really powerless in the Cretan civilization. This is a male, uh, male ruled world, okay? This is connected to androcentrism, okay? Androcentrism is a cultural and social tradition where a man and his experience are considered the norm and a woman and woman's experience are considered different from the norm, okay? So let's say the norm, now it's getting better, but I remember when I was in high school or I'm in college, reading all those magazines, female magazines are regular, getting studies, psychological studies. I did a lot of research at one point, um, at one point when I was um, doing my, PhD, my master's in psychology, I did a lot of research, so even research-wise, right? They would study the way women act because that would be a differentiation from the norm. Why? Who said? Who said that not talking about your feelings is considered to be strange and unusual? Because the way the world was viewed, we're talking about uh, for the past two and a half, a bit more than 2000 years, okay? Since the ruling of the current era, let's put it this way, okay? since uh, the way the Western world was taken over by major uh, religion, monotheistic religion, we refer to Christianity, the way the female is viewed as, basically it's an centric view of the world, okay? The male view of the world is considered to be the most uh, relevant, the most central, okay? The norm, this is the main point. And the woman's experience is considered to be like a deviation from the norm. Okay, guys, do you understand? This is the, very important to understand because it relates to this, okay? Minus is this creature, this this person who believes, you know, he, he wants. Now, again, I'm going to ask you, how do you think he reached the rulership of Crete, of the Cretan island? He killed his brothers, okay? That, that makes complete sense. If you ever uh, read anything that had to do with power, politics, you know, um, uh, taking over different lands and different worlds, the way monarchy would rule, right, is by I own, I own the land because I take over it. Okay. Monument to Dante. Okay. Okay. The this is the the sculpture of Minus sitting on the dragon. Okay. How much more male, half a male, can you get? He's sitting on the dragon, for God's sake, okay? He's like, he can tame the dragon. What do you think that's about? That's showing how strong he is. Like, look at the way he looks, right? A very masculine view. He's not smiling. He's very stern face, okay? Very important to pay attention. Now, we're getting close to the legend of the Minotaur, okay? Now, it's very interesting to note.
in a second. Let's continue. The legend of Minotaur, okay? So this is what happened, okay? Minos asked Poseidon. Poseidon is the brother of Zeus, okay? He's the god of the sea, of the water, okay? Of the sea, of the oceans, okay? To send him an animal for sacrifice, okay? He, remember, Minos thinks he's entitled. He's the son of Zeus, okay? He doesn't just ask any smaller god. He asked Poseidon himself, who is known for favoring, you know, and giving good uh, sacrifice animals, okay? Sacrifice symbols, okay? So, of course, what does Poseidon pay, send him? Pay attention to the symbolism. Snow white bull from the sea. Snow white, okay? White, white, white. Representation of the pureness, okay? Representation, remember, color white is connected more to the feminine energy. Pureness, you know, uh, femininity, and uh, like graciousness, care, comfort, okay? That connection. So, um, minus sees the bull. And I'm not going to say it falls in love with it, but he is completely in love with the way it looks, okay? So beauty of it, okay? So he puts the bull next to his herd and he sacrifices somebody else, okay? A big, big, big uh, blow to the gods. You can do that. Once a god gives you something, you have to sacrifice it to that god, okay? That's the idea. Um so as a punishment for the deception, Poseidon instills in his wife, Pasiphae. Pasiphae, the word Pasiphae, pay attention. Pasiphae. Uh, what English word does this tell you? Okay, pay attention to this as we develop the story further. She key, the Poseidon gives Pasiphae an unnatural passion for this bull from which she gave birth to the Minotaur, okay? So she basically gets so enamored with this bull, she falls. She has this physical, sexual energy attraction to this bull. Then bull, this alpha male that no female can resist. I'm giving you symbolic uh, explanation. That what does the pacifier do? She doesn't care. She thinks about him. She's obsessed with him. Okay, connection to... The female sexual energy being what? Irrational, right? She cannot control it. Again, going back to the name pacifist. The word pacified, pacific, pacified. Okay, somebody who is pacified, somebody who is so calm, somebody who has no, what? No control over their impulses. Again, a very undercentric view of the world, the view of women. Right? That a woman can be controlled. Women can just be given sexual urges by this a uh, symbol of alpha male. Notice, okay, I'm giving you the background symbolism of the story. Okay, notice how males and females are represented here. Okay, again, Greek mythology and the, the idea that the Western world is based on the Greek view of the world, okay? So Pasiphae, she's very pacified. She has no control. She is easily influenced by others, like in this case, the god of the sea, Poseidon, okay? So what does she do? She thinks carefully long time and she goes to, it's not here, but I'm telling you, Daedalus was a, a, a Greek inventor, okay? She goes to him and she says, I need to have him sexually, okay? Talking about this um, uncontrolled female sexuality that cannot be controlled, that if a female is too much in charge of her sexuality, look what's going to happen to her. This is a kind of idea, again, very undercentric view of the world when we notice what the mythology is telling us, right? And she says, so he creates some kind of a box where she goes in and the bull has sex with her. So, right, if you think about it, not, it doesn't make much sense, but that's what it is, okay? So as a result, she does have, she, she, she gets pregnant and she has a child by the name of Minotaur. Now, Important to note, very interesting thing, okay? Minus is very much aware of what his wife did. He doesn't, he doesn't divorce her. You know why? He's proud of it. Think about it. This is the bull that was given by the Poseidon. His wife has sex with it. She's gonna have a child. He names it. He named this child, not a child, it's not a human, it's a creature. He named this creature Minotaur. From the words, pay attention. Minus, Mino for minus, Taurus for bull. Okay, Taurus means bull. This word represents, means the wound, 
ball of minus. Can you believe it? He's actually proud of it, okay? Um, the minotaur was distinguished by its violent behavior and he devastated all the living creatures on the island. Basically, he ate all the cattle. He started, he finished, he ate all the animals, all the cattle on the island. He started eating humans. Um, so Minus was like, okay, we need to figure something out. He came up to this inventor came Daedalus. He said, can you create something? So Daedalus invented and created something called the labyrinth. Okay, in the center of which he hid the monster Minotaur. Okay, now, talking about symbolism. Minus monster is half bull, half man. At the same time, the head is like that of a bull, but the body is that of a human. A symbol of the fact that thinking and logic, notice, okay, are more important, most important things in a person. What kind of view is that? That's a very much an androcentric view of the world. That's a man's view of the world. Remember, we read what animals represents? Logic, thinking, hiding feelings. Feelings are not important. Important, a logical view of the world. Uh, very much a male, okay? Okay, when we chat as women, we pay attention to emotions, okay? That's important to understand. The symbol of the fact that the animal part prevails over the human is again a symbol of the fact that if you do not use your mind and logic, then a person doesn't really fool, fully live, okay? He doesn't act as a human, okay? That's the symbolism. Let's go further, okay? Here's a picture, the statue of Minotaur. This is a depiction in the uh, Greek uh, representation in art, okay? This is more modern AI representation of Minotaur. This is a famous vase from the Greek era. Also, this is from the ancient Greeks, okay? Also AI. And this is a statue of the Minotaur, okay? Let's go further in the myth, okay? Minos had a son. His name was Andragos, okay? Andragos dies from the marathon bull, okay? Again, notice the depiction of the bull. Bull is the symbol of masculine, alpha male, masculinity, okay? Minus' son, Andragas, went to Athens to visit a friend, to participate in a marathon. They let go of the white bull also. It's called the marathon bull, okay? Read up on it if you want to know more. If I tell you all the Greek mythologies, we're going to be here for hours, okay? Uh, so what happened is that Andragos was killed in Athens, okay? So as a result, Minus, okay, says, oh, you're responsible for my son's death. I mean, though, they weren't. It was an accident. He's the one who took, uh, you know, who decided to participate in a marathon. Things happened, but... Uh, according to Minus, they're responsible. Why? Uh, because he wants to take advantage of the situation. So what does he do? He forces King Aegeus to pay tribute. Seven young men and seven maidens, okay? Notice again, young men and virgin girls, okay? Again, the accentuation on the sexuality part, okay, when it comes to females, um, so it happens every year. Some versions say it happens every nine years. Some versions say every seven years. So whatever. Basically, that's what he does. He taxes them. Seven young men and seven maidens. Again, number seven is, we you know, there's a symbolism of seven days, you know, the basic natural way of the way the world lives, okay? The way the world runs. They were doomed to be eaten by the Minotaur who lived in the labyrinth. So basically what would happen is the representation of the labyrinth was more, not the labyrinth we're going to explore in this course, but more like a maze-like labyrinth, okay? Um, so the, the, the people were let into the maze. And what would happen next is that they would get lost. They wouldn't be able to come out. So Minotaur, as he would walk around the maze, he also wouldn't be able to come out. He would... Um, meet them because they're lost and he would devour them, okay? So what is the symbolism here? We talked about the bull, we talked about the, you know, maiden's symbolism, but the symbolism of Andragas, what does it represent? The symbolism is that Andragas, the reason why he was killed by the bull, which is the representation of masculinity as alpha male, right? He's not masculine enough, he's not courageous enough, and therefore he died from the symbol of male energy, okay? 
the male energy, the marathon bull. Okay, what is a bull? Male uh, symbolism of ma of masculinity. Marathon. What is that about? Sports. Who can win? Competition. Okay, very much a masculine approach to life. Okay, everybody heard of Sparta, right? Spartans who uh, focus obsessively on the sports and did not. What did they do with weak males? weak children, they would throw them from the top of the mountains, okay? So this representation is of a super sporty approach, you know, where you have to be this this very, uh, like I said, muscly looking, strong looking, this, you know, uh, reminds me of Gaston, you know, if you ever watch Beauty and the Beast kind of uh, representation. Okay, Andre Gauss is also, um, think of, different way of thinking male okay there are male who are like this strong super super strong but then there is male who are not masculine enough who don't look male, male masculine enough who are not what representation of what the males are supposed to be right those of us now i think understand it better because of the time we live in where role, gender roles have been transfused right Okay, and, and the way a lot of males who don't think that they need to act super alpha male to achieve life, okay? Okay, the word gay, G-A-Y, right? It's kind of based under gayos, okay? On the fact that this was a symbol of somebody who is not according to the masculine way of life, right? Um, was not male enough, so to say. Okay, um, here we go. This is uh, from an uh, ancient Greek depiction of how um, Andrigeos was trying to tame the white bull. Okay, now we're gonna get to the story. The, the famous legend, the hero's journey is based upon this. Okay, if you ever read um, Elegance, Joseph uh, Campbell's book, um, the hero's journey, it's based upon this mythology, okay? Mythology. Theseus is the son of the king and Athena, okay? Very important to pay attention who Theseus is, okay? Okay, now, Theseus is the son of the king uh, of Athena, Aegeus, not an Athena, uh, uh, King of Athena, Aegeus, and the Princess Ephraim, okay? According to the mythology, he's also the son of the sea god Poseidon, okay? There we go with the gods again, okay? We know about Zeus now. His brother Poseidon, not as famous about his sexual escapade as Zeus, but just similar. He wants, he sees a woman, pay attention, woman. He sees her, he wants her, he takes her, has his way with her after a certain time. He falls out of love, brings her back. He actually not as, uh, um, what would be the right way, romantically inclined as Zeus. He's more practical, you know, has his way and then goes on his way. He doesn't have the splendors where he falls in love for quite some period of time like Zeus, okay? Poseidon is more, it would be funny to say down to earth because he's a god of sea, okay? He's a representation of the water element, okay? Um, so he likes the Princess Ephra. He visits her in his godly way, whatever you want to, however you want to look at it, however you want to understand it, okay? He basically has sex with her. But then Princess Ephra in her human forms has uh, sex with her husband, who is the King Aegeus, okay? So basically, according to the Greek myth, Theseus it basically has one mother and two fathers, okay? The king, I guess, accepts him as his son, but he's also the son of God Poseidon, okay? Since childhood, he was distinguished by courage and strength, okay? Having matured, Theseus made his way to Athens, defeating many monsters and villains along the way, including the robber Procrustes, okay? Um, again, he, he goes through the trials, okay? When the time came, and his father told him of the story that they're obligated to send the tax to the Crete, the seven boys and maidens. Theseus said no. 
one of this maiden, one of these boys is going to be me. I'm going to go and I'm going to kill the Minotaur, okay? Actually, Gaius was very upset. He did not want, he loved his son crazily. He like, there's no way, okay? No way you're going. I don't want to lose you. He said, no, you're not going to lose me, dad. You know, I'm going to kill this guy, this this creature, okay? Agos, Agos for a long time did not agree, but then he finally, this is finally persuaded him. He went on the ship, okay? Again, the famous symbol, symbolism, the hero myth come, the hero's journey by Joseph Campbell. It's other famous, lots of famous books, okay? Creation of stages through which a character becomes a hero, okay, guys? This is a major, major um, theory in the um, in the Hollywood world, okay? All the uh, screenwriters, they learned this because this is how they create the screen. The, their, uh, all of the stories, that includes um how to make uh how to create a hero from any simple character okay you go some trials you defeat the minotaur and all that stuff okay let's go further okay famous uh pictures of thesis defeating the minotaur there you go he's a symbol of masculinity alpha male approach androcentrism okay Again, in the myth, Theseus is the son of two fathers, the earthy one, king of Athens, Aegeus, Aegeus, and the divine one, the god of the sea, Poseidon, okay? What does it represent? Symbolism. The hero is a symbol of the connection of heaven and earth, a combination of earthy and divine, okay? Allegory to the symbols of main religions, okay? Symbols of main religion in Judaism, it's uh, Moses. In Judaic philosophy, Moses is considered to be... Um, not considered to be the son of God, of course, but he's considered to be somewhat of an angel-like status. He's definitely much more beyond what a regular human is, okay? His capabilities, he talks to God one-on-one, -on -one. definitely beyond any prophet, any, um, there's nobody, no character in Judaism is on the level as Moses, okay? Just for you guys to know. Of course, in Christianity, nobody's going to even think twice, it's Jesus Christ, right? The son of God and the son of uh, Carpet and Joseph, right? The mother, Mary. Notice, you know, in the Greek mythology, mother is known to have sex, but in Christianity, it's it's uh, sacred that, that Mary does not have uh, any sexual relationship. She remains a virgin that has a symbolism, okay? And in Islam, not going to say I know much. So that's one thing I need to brush up on, okay? My Islam knowledge, but we definitely know Prophet, um, um, the Prophet um, Muhammad is definitely beyond being a regular human, okay? Muhammad also receives uh, learning from God, from Allah. And uh, it happens on the mountain also, certain similarity, but also beyond regular human, okay? Divine-like human. It's important to remember that main religious in our world, do you guys notice what I'm bringing here? Even if you're not connected to the Western philosophy, to the uh, Greek uh, mythology, you can still connect to this idea of a hero being beyond human, more than just human, okay? Here again, more depictions of Theseus killing the Minotaur, okay? Famous, famous uh, statues and uh, art. Ariadne and her thread. We're finally getting two healthy depiction or more or less healthy, at least healthier than what was before, depiction of female characters, feminine energy within the Greek or Roman world, okay? So, Minus uh, arrives, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Thesis arrives to Knossos, which is the capital of uh, Crete, okay, where the King Minus lives. His daughter Ariadna sees him, she falls in love with him. Again, start noticing familiarity, similarity to the Pacifa, okay, story. Okay, she falls in love with him like she can't control herself, okay. She gives Theseus, she decides to help him. She gives Theseus a ball of thread. And well, of course, Theseus being this male who will take advantage of anything to reach his goal, okay? He, when she tells him she falls in love and she asks him, how can I help you? He says, he's very logical. 
He says, practicality. I need to reach this Minotaur, reach the creature, kill him, and come on out on harm. Being ability, the ability to come out of the maze, of the labyrinth, okay? So um, Ariadna goes to Daedalus, the inventor. She gets the way the labyrinth looks. She gets the, the map, and she asks him, she says, it's impossible for anybody not to get lost in it. What do we do? And Daedalus, of course, gives her the idea of the thread, okay? You give a ball of thread. This is what she did to Titi. She gave him a ball of thread and explained how to use it to get out of the labyrinth after defeating the Minotaur, okay? Notice there's no question that he will defeat the Minotaur. Now, I want to explain to you, Minotaur was not just a regular size creature. It was a super duper size creature. It was like uh, much higher than a regular human, okay? Which shows again that they're showing Titi to be the symbol of this super strong uh, male, okay? So um, there's another version where Ariadna gives the prince a crown that glowed in the dark and illuminated his path, but we mostly are aware of the symbolism of the known uh, words Ariadna and her threat, right? It's, it's, known, it's known like allegory and metaphor in the Western world, okay? So Theseus descends into the labyrinth. She ta he takes, of course, the, the, the thread. He ties the one part of the thread. He ties the beginning of the thread, right? To the entrance of the labyrinth. And then he, as he opens up the bowl, right? And windows the bowl, he goes into the labyrinth. And this way he will follow backwards to come out of the labyrinth. He will just kind of follow the way the thread comes out, okay? He finds the Minotaur and he kills it. Okay. One of the most ancient versions of the myth. He wasn't, he didn't just kill him. He with a sword, right? We saw in some depictions he he swarded the Minotaur, but he killed him with a club. Okay. Again, somebody, some version that say he actually killed him with his hands. Can you imagine how strong he is? Okay. Um, so basically going further as the way the mythology. Um, suggests, okay, thanks to his courage and strength, as well as the help of the goddess Athena, okay, Athena later becomes a goddess, we will go into that, who was present at the fight, right, some people say she went with him, there are some versions that say she actually went inside the labyrinth with him, how brave is that, not many versions, and it's not highly talked about, okay, by the way, but something to think about, she wasn't afraid to go with him, and not just encourage him from outside, but to be next to him, okay, again, they're showing the qualities of the anima, right? We read. And then to help him get defeat and kill the monster and come out of the labyrinth. Again, the help of a guiding thread or a shining crown. Okay, what is the symbolism here? Of course, we're going to focus on Ariadne being the symbol of feminine energy, feminine origin, okay? The thread is a symbol of female mysticism. What is a thread? It's a ball of thread. You can't see what's inside. Okay, it's a ball, it's a circle, of course. We know circle is a representation of the feminine energy. Ball, the ending, the end side of the ball, the thread is in the middle. You cannot catch it, you can't find it unless you open up the ball. What is it about? Okay, female mysticism, female intuition. Okay, it's a connection to the ancient goddess, uh, an era when female types of thinking in her intuition, you know, had the same acceptance as a male view of the world, okay? Um, the Western world chose to focus the undercentric view, undercentric under part of the Greek mythology and adapted it as a major way, okay? Think about it. It took 2,000 years for females to start gaining the same rights, even the way they look at the world, the intuitive view of the world, to start gaining as much um, we're not even near 50% even. I would say 20 to 30% nowadays. Intuitive view of the world has the same uh, acceptance, okay? Not for, you know, scientific approach, even psychology, very conservative way of view is, it shouldn't be intuitive, it's more logical approach, okay? Very much a male view, okay? What else does the thread represent? Think about it, what is a thread? It's something thin that can be cut. Of course, it's a representation of the virginity, of the sexuality, of the way the women view sexuality as something sacred, right? Male don't view that way. They, you know, it's a thing. 
it's a good thing. Female, what is a traditional approach, right? You're supposed to guard your virginity. You can't just lose it to just anybody. You have to be special, right? Very sacred approach to virginity, to sexuality, okay? To experiences, okay? Experiences, the word is experience, not goal, experience, okay? Voyage, the journey. Okay, so that's very important to start understanding, again, what the myth represents, okay? When we read the mythology, the myth of what happened in the labyrinth, okay? Because this will make sense as we explore the labyrinths on a practical basis, okay? Here's the famous art depictions again. This is Ariadne and her thread. Of course, this is Theseus, right? He gives it to him. She gives it to him. This is another depiction, okay? She's spindling the thread, okay? And look, this is more of a Roman looking clause, right? More appropriate. And over here, he fights the Minotaur, okay? Connection. They show in the connection that. What other symbolism do you guys see here, okay? Without her help, would he be able to defeat the Minotaur? No. Connection of female and male. Connection of feminine and masculine energy to reach success, to be successful, to reach your goal. Remember that part, okay, as we're going to explore the practical implication of the labyrinth, okay? And it's very, I love this picture because it, it connects both, okay? She gave him the thread and that's how he's able to win the Minotaur. It doesn't matter if she wouldn't give him the threat, he wouldn't be able to defeat the Minotaur. Even if he would defeat masculinity-wise, right, strength-wise, he wouldn't be able to come out of the labyrinth and as a result, he wouldn't be successful, right? And that's the idea. When you read the hero's journey, by the way, it's very much of a masculine approach, right? Um, I am actually on my list to read the female, feminine, uh, the heroist, uh, heroine uh, journey. Because I remember I studied the hero's journey very well. I uh, We drew a mandala in the neuro mandala course. Such a male view of the world, such a male approach to everything you know um when i teach it i actually like to give it more of a female you know two-way approach there's a male and there's a female which is not highly openly accepted but i like to give it because let's you know start spreading the female also approach you know um allow that to take place in the world another also you see the fresca the beautiful fresca, right? She gives him look how down she looks. Okay, down looking is what in 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 traditional cultures that's a sign of modesty. Okay, and he give, he takes it from her, right? She gives it to him. Okay, again, symbol of virginity. Okay, the idea that she's in love with him, the idea that she's willing to sacrifice herself, her. Not just sexually, but also her what? Her soul, her mind, her emotions, her body, right? She's very brave. We don't hear the word brave when it comes to you. We hear about Thesis being a hero and a brave, but nobody talks about her being a heroine and very brave, even more brave than him, I would even say. She had more to lose. She's the daughter of Minus, okay? Who is the enemy of Thesis, okay? Just so you guys know. And we're going to see how this envelops further, how she does lose more, and then she gains, of course, much more. Okay? Okay, this is another depiction, you see? This is Ariadne, and this is, this is a beautiful statue, right? Okay, escape from Crete, okay? Okay, now. One second. Okay, what happened afterwards? After they come out of the labyrinths, of course, they're aware of the fact that Minus, who we know doesn't take defeat easily, okay? It's not about the defeat. It's about that they killed his son. Remember how proud he was a Minotaur? He was very, um, he would justify his action by the fact that he's this, you know, macho male, he's bull of Minus, okay? So of course they understand they need to escape because Minus will not be okay with it, he will kill them, okay? And Ariadne, like I said, has more to lose. She's a daughter, okay? So Ariadne and Thesis decide to sh ship away, okay? So what they do is they get on a ship, they, and, and they, again, just what happens, what they're gonna do is something very uh, sly, okay? 
they get one ship and they sail away, but they before they sail away, and that's idea, you know, they make a hole in all the other ships so nobody would 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 try to uh, reach them, okay? Would try to, um, yeah, go after them. So they run away, but then guess what happens? They have a storm on the sea. Who knows why? A few seconds. Think why. Why do they have a storm at the sea? Who did they kill? They killed the Minotaur. Whose son is a Minotaur? Beside Minus, who accepts him as his son. He's a son of the bull that Poseidon protruded. So if Poseidon is not happy, he considered Minotaur to be his creature in a way, okay? So um, he makes the storm sea. So they stop on the island of Naxos, okay? He says, after a certain time, he leaves Ariadna on this island and he sails himself. He says, I'm going to go home. Look, we don't have much space or some, there was some kind of problem. I think there was like one ship and he says there's not space for both of us to leave. I want to go faster. I don't want to be responsible for you, right? He leaves her and he goes home, okay? Now at home, something happens where when they originally, his father, King Aegeus, let him go, he said, look, he spoke to the ship and he said, look, what um, happened is that if you are not going to be successful, if my son dies, he tells the ship, um, oh, so this is the original ship that they take away from that he sailed on to Crete and then he escaped from Crete with Ariadne and he leaves Ariadne on the island saying, you know, uh, it's not you, it's me. I need to go, I need to take care of something. Uh, meanwhile, on the way home, he does few more, um, he, he shows few more, he does few more um, acts of heroism, okay? Ariadne is meanwhile sitting and faithfully waiting for him to come back. Um, we're gonna explore that further. Um, he doesn't, he goes to his home, okay, to the Athens. In Athens, his father, he forgets that he promised his father he had black sails when he left, because to his father, that was a sign of mourning his father, his son is leaving. And he said, if you're coming back, remember to change it into white, this way I will see from the far. Every day, King uh, 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 Aegeus would go to the shore to seek his son coming back. And he would seek white sails, okay? And the familiar ship. Thesis, completely forgot about it. Again, talking about male, not paying attention to this emotional part, you know, just logical, okay? He forgets to change it. He doesn't care about emotional attachments, right? Symbolism again. And the father, his father sees from afar the, the ship, but not white sails, but rather black he says oh that means my son has died because that's was the agreement with the ship uh, crew they forgot to change it and he forgot he says forgot and the father sees it from afar he thinks his son who died has died in the battle with a minotaur he was sacrificed to minotaur and he jumps from the top of the mountain from the top uh, and he falls and he crashes okay he dies basically okay Theseus comes what can you do he becomes the king of Athens okay he takes over the kingdom from his father okay let's continue explore the story of Ariadne since she's the symbolism of female feminine approach okay Ariadne again without a thread I named it okay after Ariadne was left alone on the island and Thesis did not return for her, she grieved, okay? She gave him her heart and uh, he shattered his, right? Uh, however, the story does have a happy ending. It's very interesting to notice, okay? Very important to pay attention. We're going to talk about symbolism. God Dionysus, which everybody knows is the god of wine, but he's also known as a god of joy. Wine goes with joy, notice. He saw her and he falls in love with her. Okay, their love story is full of female romanticism, romanticism. Okay, for example, it is known that Dionysus loved her so much that he gave her a constellation in the sky. Okay, there's a famous constellation, the Ariadna constellation. Okay, and of course, the main symbolism is that after marrying the god Dionysus, Ariadna becomes a goddess. Okay, a symbolism of feminine energy and the feminine principle of feminine 
And again, this is a, a very traditional cultural approach, right? She sacrificed herself. She gets to become a goddess, okay? Somebody, a female of more active approach is not goddess material, but she is because she self-sacrificed, okay? Promoting this idea of the self-sacrifice being the right way to view the way females are supposed to act in the world, okay? Symbolism again, female romanticism, happy ending, constellation in the sky, symbol of romance novels, right? What do we do when we read romance novels? We're looking for this, you know, good guy coming and saving us from this masculine macho who shattered our heart kind of, right? Idea, right? Um, Sex in the City, did anybody watch last, right? Um, the ideas, right? Again, Look at this beautiful, I love this painting. Look how pretty, how beautiful she depicted. Look at her face. You can feel her emotions through the way the painter ex expo exploded here. Okay, this is a fresca. Look how beautiful it is. Dionysus and Ariadna, right? There you go, there again. Dionysus and Ariadna, okay, together. Oh. No, no, this this statue is very interesting. Look on top of what they're riding, the chariot, right? Also Dionysus and Ariadna. Okay, Theseus, the making of a hero. The story of Theseus continues. Theseus would later perform many heroic deeds and would be fully canonized as the symbol of a mythical, I might also add, male hero, okay? For our story, we will leave him here, move on to study the symbolism of labyrinth, okay? Just one little symbol talking about right romantic stories guess who is one of the wives of thesis is Phaedra okay Phaedra the wife uh, that becomes his wife and she's Ariadna's sister but that's a whole different myth now okay there's a very interesting myth involved there by the way just if you want to follow up and read you find it very entertaining and also full of symbolism but for our purposes we're going to move on Okay, the story, this the myth we're going to bring at the end. The last myth will be the story of Daedalus and Icarus. If you remember, Daedalus was the inventor of this uh, labyrinth, minus when the Ariadna and Thesis killed the Minotaur, his pride of his island. He was, he, he had, uh, Minotaur was this creature that he was saying this is a symbol of Crete, okay? Minus gets very mad. He decides to punish he wants to look for Ariadna and Thesis, but of course they escape. He can't reach them, so he takes his wrath. And who? Daedalus. He realizes that it's thanks to Daedalus that Ariadna came up with this idea of saving her boyfriend, lover, right? Um, so he decides to pursue Daedalus. Daedalus finds out, of course, and he escapes. He runs away from Crete and he hides in Sicily, the Sicily. Uh huh. Talking about taking revenge, okay? In the city of Camicus, okay? So, Minus is very smart, very conniving, okay? Cunning, okay? So, what does Minus do? How does he try to find Daedalus, okay? So, he travels all over, he goes to every island. He knows Daedalus must be one of them. In every city he asks, he goes through, he says, I have an interesting challenge and you can win the prize if you solve it. How do you pass a thread through the spiral shell? Think about the symbolism, spiral shell, okay? The idea of spiral, this, the symbolism of expansion, growth, okay? Um, and mine is trying to suppress it, okay? Symbolism of this male view of the world, well, the world can only work according to his view, cannot go further, okay? And of course, Daedalus, who is this idea of... Um, Symbol of vertical growth, fly up to the sky, fantasy, imagination, but also connection. He's an inventor. He knows how to use um, nature-made objects and his own mind to create new inventions that men, men-made inventions that conquer nature. Okay, go grow beyond, grow the way humans view life and use life. Okay. So of course, Daedalus knows how to thread how to thread it. He harnesses an ant. He attaches the ant to the thread and goes through the spiral and comes out on the other end. Of course, Minus knows that only Daedalus is clever enough. By the way, notice he's a male. 
only one. He's a male clever. He's only clever enough to solve it. So he says, I know it's Daedalus. I demand you hand it over to me. The Kokalites, they're the daughters of King Kokal, the king of that island, the city where Minas uh, found Daedalus. The daughters say they also notice a uh, uh, kind of tricky female way. What did they do? They kill Minas in the bathhouse. They pour boiling water in the bathtub through the pipes and scold him to death. Okay, saying that you can't kill somebody who is this macho, symbol of macho, machoness, and, you know, alpha male, only maybe through some kind of female way of slyness, okay? Finding a different way of killing this power object, okay? Um, the story of Daedalus and Icarus. Icarus is a symbol of ego and groundedness, okay? Um Daedalus wants to escape from the island and he has a son, Icarus, and he says, who unfortunately didn't go in the same cleverness as his father. He didn't inherit it. So what Daedalus do, he created wings. Again, look at it symbolically. Don't look at it as a fairy tale because it's all about symbolism. He creates wings. Daedalus creates wings that attaches to the hands and the back. And he says, let's fly up. And he tells his son, Icarus, okay? By the way, this is Icarus higher up. Daedalus is lower down. He says, don't, class, don't fly too high. You will get too close to the sun. The heat will melt the, um, what do you call that? Not the clay, but um, um, in my mind, this black, um, it's um, a chemical, basically, that melts. Because the way the feathers were connected together was through this uh, like petroleum type of a plastic thing, okay? Um, and, and he says, if you fly too high up, it will melt and your feathers will fall down. You basically will have no wings and you will fall down and um, kill, be killed, okay? They fly over the sea because Sicily is on the, is an island, okay? And of course, Icarus forgets what his father warned him to not to do. He flies too high up, flies, flies close to the sun. That's a symbol of ego. Don't get too carried away with your ego. Don't get too close thinking, oh, I'm so high. I can do whatever I want to. Because it will melt the petroleum. It will melt this plastical clay thingy that... Binds your wings, the wings will fall. And what happened to Icarus? He falls in the water and drowns. Notice, he drowns. Also showing this, this very, not a very mature approach, okay? Um, what else? He, the Dallas, of course, escapes. There are more stories with him later on, but uh, the story of Icarus and the Dallas is the symbolism of Icarus being ego symbol of ego, you know, thinking they can do whatever they want to, but Daedalus is a symbol of vertical growth, fly up to the sky, fantasy, imagination, um, but being able to control your urges, your fantasy, your imagination. This is very important when you walk the labyrinth, okay? Important to walk the labyrinth, to go to the center, to reach the center, but it's also important to come out of the center. Learn to understand what the main point of life is, okay? This is another depiction. You see Icarus falling down. Okay, labyrinth and mace is what I want to bring. We're almost done. In myth, mace or labyrinth. This is very important to understand. There are interesting opinions that in the original myth, the Minotaur was actually imprisoned precisely in the mace style labyrinth, okay? There you go. And this is interesting what happened. After, pay attention, this is very important. Theseus defeated the monster and left the labyrinth with the help of Ariadne's threat again, the connection of female and male, feminine and masculine energy together. We can succeed, okay? That is the connection, right? And male, female principles. The very essence of this labyrinth has changed. And it became the labyrinth, which is one entry, one way to enter and exit the labyrinth, the point of the labyrinth to get to the center, which is sacred space. We will explore it in other sessions and come out same way you came in. The journey 
two important parts in walking the labyrinth. Reaching the goal, which is the center, but it's the journey. Walking the labyrinth, many say, is even more important than reaching the center because I, I say both are important. You're entering to reach the center, but you pay attention to your journey. Okay, we're going to practice this many, many times, okay? At least two, three times through each, through, during each practical session. And then it's important to come out of the center and again, pay attention to your journey, okay? Notice again here, the maze and the labyrinth. Okay, labyrinth has one entrance, which will inevitably reach the center. There is no any other option in the maze. There are different ways and you may reach or may not reach the center. It's not pleasant. Most people, when they think of the labyrinth, they think of the maze. In Russian, by the way, there is no word maze. The word, both words, maze and labyrinth is, is the, called the labyrinth. It's interesting to note, okay? Russian is the uh, highly based upon Greek uh, mythology. Okay, very simplified version of the Greek mythology, Greek philosophy. Okay, um, the Russians use Cyrillic uh, language and Cyrillic alphabet, which is the same as Greek. Just so you know, the names are the same as the Greek. Greek Orthodox is a main uh, religion form of Christianity in Russia. Just for you to understand that they have a very strong connection to the Greek language, okay, and the Greek philosophy and uh, way of life, okay? So um, many people, it's important to start explaining when you start using it for practical reasons, especially when you use it with sessions with clients, that labyrinth is as one way, you will inevitably reach the center and you will come out with no harm, okay? It's not the same as the maze where people get anxious, oh my God, will I get lost? By the way, this anxiety, will I get lost? Of course, is what? That's right. Collective unconscious to the way people connected to the maze in the original labyrinth myth. Will I come out? Will I be devoured by a mentor? Will I be harmed? Okay? Protection from harm. Okay? This is what it says here. This is the message. You're sold on the path to enlightenment. You're traversing a labyrinth. You are not in a maze, okay? Very important. One entry, and you will inevitably reach the center, okay? Important to note, we're going to, again, explore this further. There is a construction that has either the same entrance, one entrance reaching the center. Sometimes, so basically two types of labyrinths, one entry or two entries, okay? Both are not a maze. When you enter, this is a two entry. You go to the right side, you will, re you will reach the center. You go to the left side, you will reach the center. The right side, you reach the center, I think. Here, let me try it. Yeah. When you go to the right, you, you go all in all of the journey. You take a long journey to reach the center. When you go to the left, you take a very short journey to reach the center, okay? Just so you know. It's very important to understand it, okay? It's not a confusing, it's not a maze, okay? It's important to understand and realize because the symbolism here is that when the masculine and feminine energy work together and unite, something new appears, okay? A mystical connection of heaven and earth, of course, or a representation of the feminine energy and heaven, representation of the masculine energy, okay? And this is uh, leftover of the actual uh, Cretan labyrinth which we refer to as the Cretan labyrinth. We also will refer to it as a classical labyrinth, okay? And uh, we'll reach the end. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I think this makes more sense to you, right? This drawing, right? This uh, presentation, right? Uh, this is, of course, the Minotaur. This is Theseus, right? And this is Ariadne in the beginning and at the end, right? Being hopeful and she's praying here, right? Over here, she's waiting for Theseus to come out, okay? And of course, the labyrinth circular shape. Many people, by the way, say that the la original labyrinth was more square. Um, but, um, we will talk next session. The theory will be, I will explore the um, historical, famous historical, the history of labyrinths throughout the world, okay? Actual 
real lifetime rabbits, okay? Thank you for joining me. Um, I enjoyed presenting this information to you. Let me know, give me background, comment if you uh, listened, uh, comment in Facebook under this post that uh, you listened, how much you enjoyed it, did you, were you did interesting, um, any questions, of course, okay? And I'm looking forward to seeing you on Monday. Monday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, EST, I'm gonna start exploring practically, okay, the labyrinths. I will post the pictures of the labyrinths. Please print them out before the session, or you can just look at the picture on the iPad and we're just gonna actually use our fingers to, to walk through them. But it's, I think it's better if you print it out, okay? Because maybe we will be start the drawing exploration. Thank you and enjoy your weekend.